What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled as always by the incredible folks at Nerd Tees, and welcome to week 12, a lucky dozen episodes of my weekly CFL football pick show for the 2019 CFL regular season, and we couldn't quite make it a hat trick of really successful weeks in a row. This was by no means an abomination last week, but didn't exactly do the greatest. Went 3-1 and one on the pick straight up, so that's always good news, and we're back up to 70% straight up, which is also good news, that's where we want to be. However, betting picks didn't exactly go very well. Only 1-2-1 one, and one against the spread had our very first push of the season. Took 11 weeks to get our first push of the season, either against the spread or on a total, and only went 1-3 and three on the totals. We are ice cold on the totals in the last few weeks really not going all that well only five six and one across all the picks from last week in the cfl has me 76 52 and one on the season so we're 58.91 percent we are just below that threshold that i'm looking for that magic 60 percent by virtue of Winnipeg's win last week, they now take a t full two-game lead in the West Division at 8-2 and two over the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, who have reeled off five consecutive wins and now sit second place in that division at 6-3. and three. Hamilton still has a lead on Montreal, but, you know, could start to dwindle here if Hamilton continues to not exactly play the greatest football. They're still picking up wins but they're not exactly playing the best ball. And look, Montreal is more than capable of catching them here. Hamilton sits at 8-2, and two, Montreal at 5-4. and four. In the official Atlantic Schooners CFL fantasy football pool, I, I continue to drop down the standings because of my complete inability to not pick Dane Evans at quarterback. I've slipped all the way down to 29th now out of 68 people inside this pool only 55.6 points in week 11 look i've really struggled lately uh with the exception of like one week where i went over 100 points it's been a struggle here in the last i'd say probably four to five weeks 884.6 points overall like i'm still in you know that that halfway mark i'm still in contention here not totally out of it but i i really got to pick things up my week 11 MVP, William Powell at the running back position for Saski, 11 carries, only 70 yards, but found the end zone twice, added one nine-yard catch, good for 20.9 fantasy points, good enough to be the MVP. And my week 12 CFL fantasy lineup is... You like how I faked you out last week? I'm doing it again. It's right here in front of your eyes now. We are changing things up at the quarterback position. We are going to be going with Arbuckle from Calgary, and we're going to actually be stacking him with Reggie Begleton. Begleton is Calgary's leading receiver. I think they're going to be able to do some damage through the air. I think that's actually going to be probably the highest scoring game of the week, being Edmonton and Calgary. So we're stacking Arbuckle with Begleton. In the run game, we're taking both starting running backs from that Hamilton-Toronto game, Marshall and Rainey for Hamilton and Toronto, respectively. Neither one of those run defenses are all that great. But we are going to run with Hamilton's defense. I mean, Toronto's one of the worst offenses, if not the worst offense, in the CFL. So if we're going to play a defense, it's definitely going to be against Toronto's offense. That is your fantasy lineup for the CFL in Week 12. And our slate of actual real-world games this week, only three games in the CFL this week. We've got Winnipeg in Saskatchewan to take on the Riders. Winnipeg, I mean, the news just keeps getting worse for them. Toronto is in Hamilton to take on the Ticats. And Edmonton in Calgary to take on the Stamps. Winnipeg in Saski to take on the Riders. Look, the Bombers have been playing excellent football lately. They're 3-1 and in their last four, outscoring opponents by almost two full possessions. And they did pick up the win last week. Look, they beat Edmonton 34-28 to in Edmonton. I didn't take them to win. I took the Esks. So that's a big win for the Bombers, a character win for them with all the people that they're missing. And it wasn't really because of Chris Strevler throwing the ball. More so, of course, with Strevler and what he can do on the ground. But Strevler only threw 41% and less than 100 yards. It was his running ability and the ability of that defense that really made up the difference in that football game. The Bombers defense makes the plays count, generating three turnovers off of Edmonton, sacking Trevor Harris three times, 
five pass knockdowns in the secondary, and the defense only took two penalties for 15 yards. And Winnipeg actually did a good job not taking a lot of penalties in the game in general. I think they only had five for 45, but the defense wasn't shooting themselves in the foot, and that's what they needed to do to win a football game like that. Obviously, the elephant in the room here for the Bombers is Andrew Harris getting popped for a banned substance. He obviously does what athletes are supposed to do and claims that he didn't know about it and everything like that. That's obviously a developing story and it's a big story, but what we do know is Andrew Harris is going to miss the next two football games because of being popped for this banned substance. And there is a real discussion going on about, A, was Andrew Harris the front runner for most outstanding player up to this point. And because of this, does that even matter anymore? Like, is there any consideration still to be given, whether it was done intentionally or not done intentionally or completely accidentally, does that completely kill his argument for most outstanding player? That's an interesting question. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. All the Rough Riders did last week was continue to be the hottest and arguably the best team in the CFL playing right now. They have won five consecutive games, pulled their record all the way up to six and three. I feel so good about that Grey Cup Futures bet that I made when they were like plus 1600 or something ridiculous like that. They picked up a 40 to 18 win against the lowly, suddenly lowly Ottawa Red Blacks last week. And it was the big guns on both sides of the football. The offense got the job done and the defense got the job done. William Powell and Cody Fajardo combined for four total touchdowns in that game and nearly 350 yards of total offense just between the two of them. And on the defensive side, they generated five turnovers, which led directly to 24 points for the Riders. You could take away every point that they didn't score off of a turnover, and they still win this game by a fully converted touchdown. No, they don't. They win it by an unconverted touchdown. Whatever. That's math. It wasn't all sunshine and rainbows for Sasky in that game, though. An astronomical 16 penalties taken in that football game for 186 total yards. If they were playing a better team, obviously that would have shot them in the foot. They might not have won that game. And I said it before, something like that can't happen as the games get bigger. This is a bigger game on their schedule, despite the fact that the Bombers don't have Matt Nichols, don't have Darvin Adams, won't have Andrew Harris. That's three of their biggest weapons on offense. Despite the fact that they don't have those, this is still arguably Saskatchewan's biggest game of the year, and they certainly can't have a repeat performance of that complete wanton lack of discipline. Look, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers have absolutely made me a believer this season in their abilities to beat any team at any time, but no matter how I try and no matter how much I've seen from Winnipeg that would lead me to believe, look, they're more than capable of winning this game, I don't see back-to-back -back wins on the road. Winnipeg's win last week was in Edmonton, now they go in there in Saskatchewan. It's tough to win back-to-back -back road games in any football league, the CFL is no exception to that it's just a tough thing to do especially without your starting quarterback your number one wide receiver and now your elite all world starting running back that's uh, just a very tall task to have to do and I just can't see the path that they take to get there so I'm going to take the riders at home I like Saskatchewan to hang just the third loss of the season on the Blue Bombers and really make things interesting in the West on the line, the Riders are favored by a full six points at home, which seems like a big line for a game like this, especially where these two defenses are really, really good. I think I kind of have to take it, though. Obviously, I really didn't like what I saw from Strevler through the air. He can get it done on the ground, but without that Andrew Harris, you know, security blanket there, I... I just don't know what Winnipeg's going to be able to generate in this game. So it's under a touchdown. I think I got to take that. So I think we're going to hammer the riders here at home. Take Sasky minus six. Total in the game is set at 48 points. I think I got to go under on it because once again, two really good defenses. Nothing wrong with that Winnipeg defense. Certainly nothing wrong with that Sasky defense. And they're both playing incredibly well right now. And it's the offensive injuries and the suspension on Winnipeg's side that I think really limits their ceiling in this football game. So we are going to stick and play it safe, go under 48 points in Winnipeg and Saski. And no time like the present since we only have two games remaining to pump the tires of our wonderful friends 
at NerdTees, nerdtees.ca. Use that promo code BWFINEST. You're going to save yourself 15% at checkout. You're going to get free shipping in the great country of Canada on any order over 75 bucks. If you're in the U.S., two clicks of a button, everything is in U.S. prices for you and you get an excellent conversion on the U.S. dollar. Today's blend is Japanese orange cooler, a strong tangy citrusy type thing. Smells fantastic, tastes really good. NerdTees.ca, promo code BWFINEST. Tons of great blends there. Find yourself something to love or find someone you love something to love. Never too early to start thinking about Christmas. You can do it on nerdtees.ca. Cheers. Let's go to the hammer now for a battle of best versus worst in the East Division. The Toronto Argos are going to be in town play, taking on the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Yeah. Toronto, 1-8 and eight on the season. Losers of two consecutive games after picking up their first win of the year. Only 1-3 and three in their last four and giving up over 30 points a game. They lost the touchdown Atlantic game in Moncton against Montreal by about a touchdown. Lost that game 28-22. to 22. But they had a lead. And if neither side of the football in the second half of this football game, neither the offense nor the defense, were able to maintain that 10-point halftime lead. The Alouettes outscoring the Argos 22-6 to in the second half of that game. But the one person on the Argos that I cannot fault for that is McLeod Bethel Thompson. He is doing absolutely everything that he possibly can to keep his job once Zach Kalaros is ready to play football again. MBT, over 76% completions on his passes, 464 pass yards, once again had a clean game, did not throw any interceptions. He's doing everything he can to keep his job and put his team in a position to win. And even right down to the final plays of the game, the Argos were, I believe, on Montreal's like three-yard line or something like that. They were well inside the red zone, and they just couldn't get it done at the end of the game. Montreal with a couple of pass knockdowns, that's the end of the football game. And after a monster performance, yardage-wise at least, in the first half from the Argos, in the second half, they punted the ball four times and had a turnover on downs. Just not good enough in the second half of that football game to close out what was a winnable game for them. Ticats, meanwhile, continue to find ways to win. They are winners of three straight games, sitting at 8-2. and two, And in their last four, they've won three. They beat BC last week just by a field goal. Only 13-10, that game was in BC. The defense kind of showed up for both teams in that football game. I won't be able to talk about BC until next week. The defense showed up in, on both sides, but it was the fact that the Ticats could generate seven quarterback sacks on Mike Riley. Stop me if you've heard that before this season. If I'm being perfectly honest, I think the Ticats were outplayed for most of that football game, got carried to a win by what was a swarming pass defense. Obviously the seven sacks that we mentioned, but four pass knockdowns and two interceptions in the secondary for the Ticats. It was the defense that carried them to that win last week. And I kind of talked about Dane Evans and my inability until this week to move away from him from a fantasy perspective in what is now the equivalent of five starts, because obviously he came into that game where Masoli got hurt. It wasn't a start, but he basically played the vast majority of that game. Evans is now averaging less than 210 yards passing per game in those equivalent of five starts. And his touchdown to interception ratio is only four to six, four touchdowns, six picks. He's thrown four interceptions in his last two games. I mean, obviously it goes without saying this Ticats team is not the same Ticats team we saw earlier in the season, but I would rather err on the side of caution and err on the side of the defense in a game like this, I just don't see Toronto winning this game. Toronto doesn't win games on the road. I, I just don't see it happening. So we are going to go with the Thai Cats here, and we're going to go with that defense. That's why I took them in fantasy this week. We are going with the Hamilton Thai Cats at home to put another loss on the Toronto Argos. However, against the spread, Hamilton currently favored by, get this, 12 and a half points. The last four games... Hamilton's 3-1. and one. That's fantastic. They're only outscoring opponents by an average of three points a game. It's 22-19. to 19. I get that Toronto is not good on the defensive side. But guess what? Hamilton is not good on the offensive side of the ball right now. They're not putting up the points they were putting up earlier in the season. There's not like there's this gigantic chasm 
in terms of what these offenses are producing right now. And given that, I don't see any reason why the spread is as huge as it is other than Toronto's terrible defense. That's a long-winded way of saying 12 and a half points is way too many points for how Dane Evans is playing right now. So we're going to hedge our bets here and we're going to go Toronto plus the 12 and a half against the spread. Total in the game set at 51 and a half points. I have to go under on it again because it's a number that begins with five. These are two offenses that quite frankly, are not very good right now and haven't displayed over the last little while that they are very good. So I could see a lot of yardage in this game, just not necessarily a ton of points on the board. I got it capped somewhere around a mid 40. So I think we're looking at like 43, 44 points, something like that. So it's strong enough for me to stay well under the 51 and a half point total. And the last game we're going to look at, because only three games on the schedule this week, is the Edmonton Eskimos traveling to Calgary. Eskimos now six and four on the season. They lost last week uh, by a full touchdown, 34 to 27 against Winnipeg. That game again was in Edmonton. Edmonton only playing average football over the last four. They're two and two, only outscoring opponents by an average of two points a game. So it's fairly average football. Trevor Harris was not average in that game last week. 470 total yards between passing and running. And that day kind of goes to waste as the defense never really got into their groove and never really got going in that game. And look, don't get me wrong. Defensive plays were made in that football game. Like Edmonton's defense had three quarterback sacks. They generated two turnovers. They knocked down two passes in the secondary. They made some plays. But what I mean by that is... Like Winnipeg in that game against Edmonton was able to score 10 or more points in three of the four quarters. You can't do that against a team like Winnipeg, against an elite good football team. And Edmonton trailed 20 to 9 at the half. You can't do that if you want to beat an elite team like Winnipeg. And Edmonton's playing another elite team this week. And in thinking about the Eskimos, I feel like it's the curious case of C.J. Gable. I don't really know what to make of C.J. Gable right now. He's, he's very elusive to me as a player. He has as many games of running for 60 yards or fewer as he does 100 yards or more. And that's three games apiece. So he's this weird in-between where he's not, he can be elite, he can be mediocre, but more often than not, he's in this hazy gray area. Also doesn't help. Gable's only found the end zone twice this year. The Stampeders come into this game losers of two consecutive games, really only playing dead average football over their last four. Their loss came back in week 10, that 40 to 34 miracle victory by the Montreal Alouettes in overtime. The Stamps surrendered 34 points in the second half and overtime of that football game, including 11 points in the final minute of the fourth quarter. Nick Arbuckle had himself a hell of a game last week against a Montreal secondary that suddenly is not very good. But Arbuckle, 86% completions on his passes, 370 passing yards last week, four touchdowns, no picks, all four of those touchdowns going to Reggie Begleton. You'll wonder why I stacked them this week in fantasy. Eight catches, 173 yards for Begleton, and all four Arbuckle touchdowns. And when you're a football team like the Stampeders and you hold yourself, obviously, to a very high standard, losing often becomes like a story of what-ifs. And there's a lot of what-ifs about this game, but the one that really stands out to me is, what if Calgary doesn't take 13 penalties for 141 yards? In a game that took a miracle comeback for you to lose have those penalties and that comeback probably doesn't happen so it's again it's a lot of what ifs when you lose a football game i know calgary's been sitting on this been stewing on it all through their bye week they can't feel good about it and uh i think we're going to see a much different stampeders team this week the edmonton eskimos are two and three in games against teams in the west division not a great record but not a terrible record however both of those wins against teams in the West have come in a pair of games where they just beat up on hapless BC. So all three of the other games that they have played against the good teams in the West Division, that's two games against Winnipeg and a game against Calgary, they lost those games. And they lost those games by at least six points apiece. And I don't necessarily like 
the prospects of them going into Calgary to play what should be a pissed off Stampeders team because of how they lost that game back in week 10. I like the Stamps. I guess I'm on all the home teams this week. I'm taking Calgary at home to hang a second straight loss on the Edmonton Eskimos. On the line, Calgary's only a a three-and-a-half point favorite at home, which is not a lot for a very, very good home team. Edmonton, not exactly the greatest team away from home. I kind of like that. I think I'm going to take that, even though we are giving up the half point. It's not a lot to give up. We're going to take Calgary minus the three-and-a-half points. And the total in the game set at 48. I personally think this is right around a perfect total. I think this is a coin flip, but I could see this game being a race to 25 or 26, something like that. So I think I'm going to go over on it. We're going to go over the 48 points in Calgary and Edmonton. There you go, folks. The picks are in for the Week 12 games in the CFL. Going to go over them here with you one more time. I've got Saskatchewan at home beating a Winnipeg Blue Bombers team that's without its three best offensive playmakers, so shouldn't be any real surprise there. I'm hammering Saskatchewan minus six against the spread in a game that stays under the 48-point total. I've got the Hamilton Tiger Cats at home putting another loss on the Toronto Argos. However, we are hedging against the spread, taking Toronto plus 12 and a half. That's just way too many points in a game that stays under 51 and a half points. And in the finale this week, week we're going to take the Calgary Stampeders at home to beat the Edmonton Eskimos we're going to hammer Calgary minus three and a half against the spread in the only game we're taking over this week over 48 points there you go folks week 12 episode is in the books that's it for me Justin Bridgewater's finest on YouTube blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter fueled as always by the incredible folks at Nerd Tees. Week 12 is in the books. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch, and we will see you again for lucky week number 13.